Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Fringe event uh, webinar from the Oxford Farming Conference on how to capture the value from natural capital. My name is Tom Allen Stevens, um, and while it's such a shame that we're not meeting in person at the exam schools in Oxford, the whole team is really excited uh, to be hosting and supporting this event today. So over the next 40 minutes uh, or so, we want to explore what these new natural capital markets hold for farmers. Uh, we know that there's a spectrum of views um, and that there are some fundamental questions. And we hope that you'll help us unravel some of the issues, clarify the uncertainties, uh, so that all farmers and land managers can take control of their, nat uh, their natural assets in, the, in their care uh, and make the most of the opportunities that exist. So in a moment, I'm going to hand over to our founder uh, and executive chairman, Hussein Kujar Husseini, uh, to outline his vision for the journey that we're all on. Uh, but I'd just like to point you to the, to the chat button that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Now, we're keen for your questions and for your views, um, and I'll be putting as many of those as I can to the team uh, who will join us in a bit. Um, and we're also going to be asking for your views through three poll questions. So get ready to get involved. Uh, first, though, I'd like to hand over to Hussein to say a few words. So, Hussein. Thank you, Tom. And thanks very much, everyone, for joining Trinity this morning. Last year, the world generated an income of about $94 trillion. Similar to previous years, about 52% of this income was reliant on natural capital. So why did owners and stewards of natural capital receive not 52% of that income, nor even 22% of that income, but less than 2% of that income. What's also interesting is the result of a study that was commissioned a few years ago by T. The study tallied up the world's unpriced natural capital and found that if the world's biggest companies had to pay for the ecosystem services they were leveraging, none of them would be profitable. Therefore, is it any wonder that all ecosystem services have been in decline and have reached a watershed moment? To me, I would say when there's inadequate financial appreciation of natural capital, when the invisible hand of an efficient, fair, and purposeful market system is absent, when powerful companies and institutions create an aristocracy of their own, we end up with greenwashing, we talk, and with Soviet-style decisions and outcomes that don't foster widespread creativity, equitable prosperity, and growth of natural capital, but we end up with inequity, economic marginalization, and an environment where only a very few strike it lucky. So now, and only because of an, an existential crisis, we've been handed the colossal opportunity to embark upon a new journey and to pave a new future. I'm reminded this opportunity is as remarkable an opportunity as that which was handed in 1760 to the two million people in the country I'm currently visiting and from which I'm speaking to you today, the United States. As you know, the opportunity to design a fresh future not only led to the legal establishment of America, but it radically transformed the prospects of American people and society well beyond anything anyone had perceived possible. America was transformed from disparate underdeveloped colonies huddled along a narrow strip of the Atlantic coast influenced by a hierarchy of ranks and disparate degrees of dependency into one that within 50 years 
had become the most innovative and prosperous country in the world. Today also with people sporting the greatest volume of philanthropy in the world. But it goes without saying that with the colossal opportunity that befell Americans also came the possibility of an equally colossal failure. After all, it was rife with cowboys. But the three steps from which we can learn, the American pioneers, the founding fathers who gathered in Philadelphia, the, the steps that they took were one, they recognized the diversity, the variety, and the idiosyncrasies of opinion across different individuals, different towns, regions, and socioeconomic groups. Second, they made and facilitated the interests and financial prosperity of ordinary people and the, the diversity of their needs, the goal of society and government. Third, they established a set of common beliefs with a common political and legal platform that rivaled everything else in existence and hence helped unleash entrepre entrepreneurial and commercial energies, which many hadn't realized was present within them and thereby fundamentally transformed the economic and social prospect of every citizen and the country as a whole. The opportunity we have here is no less colossal. To enjoy equitable financial returns for our natural capital and to deliver a sustainable future, we can learn from history and similarly take three steps. Indeed, this is what we've done at Trinity. First, recognizing the validity of diverse opinions and preferences and respecting the different ways through which people ascribe value, meaning, and importance to different forms of natural capital. Hence, we facilitate not one market, but many markets. Secondly, focusing on fair, efficient, and virtuous outcomes, where transparency, clarity, collaboration, insight, and foresight are advanced. This would also mean supporting transparency and open dialogue on A, how greenwashing is facilitated so that we perhaps finally end the decades long vicious circle of inequity and environmental decline. And B, to safeguard against green grabs by those who under the auspices of supporting green try to extend their capital accumulation through unfair means which only foster these possessions as well as social and eco ecological marginalization. Third, providing and using globally credible, independent and authoritative tools and platforms. Over the past three and a half years, a question we've asked ourselves has been, who should exercise power in a green purposeful capitalist market. We at Trinity have said what the American pioneers said, that it must be the ordinary farmers and landowners, not corporations or convenient coalitions that have presided over decades long destruction of natural capital and farmers economics, and hence contributed to the existential crisis we now find ourselves in. Therefore, my call to you, owners and stewards of natural capital, is to take control, join us on an authentic, globally credible, purposeful journey that radically transforms our prospects beyond what we may deem possible. Thank you so very much. And now our team has a short video, which I'd be grateful if it could be played. We're at an extraordinary time of transition for British agriculture.
from production to innovation, from public subsidies to private markets. Together, Trinity AgTech and Trinity NCM provide farmers with a credible end-to-end -end digital platform, delivering growth of your natural capital and real financial gains. The two firms are built on leading scientific and technological know-how, international standards, and rigorous financial and rural estate law. Sandy is the digital assistant that measures your farm's carbon baseline, your biodiversity score, and your water protection work. It provides non-prescriptive solutions, helps you develop an action plan to improve, and informs your decisions. Through Trinity AgTech's seven steps, Sandy prepares you to earn carbon credits and biodiversity tokens, which can then be traded to generate a whole new farm income. Our digital natural capital trading platform brings buyers and sellers of carbon credits and biodiversity tokens together in a dynamic marketplace. It's been built to be as robust as any other financial market. Sandy and Trinity NCM work seamlessly together based on the latest science and legal expertise to deliver a fair, efficient and virtuous solution for maximizing natural capital gains. Trinity NCM enables you to trade through one-year contracts or longer-term forward contracts with investors and organizations who are keen to offset their own residual emissions or proactively support natural capital. Trinity's next generation tools have arrived at a critical time as farmers seek out new income streams to replace the ending of farm support and adjust to the introduction of new environmental policy. As well as opening the door to new revenues, it enables the farm to align with government policy, improve product provenance, build stronger supply chain relationships, move closer to consumer demand, and ultimately develop a more resilient business. Trinity's framework and methodology is robust, transparent, and easy to use. The platform offers a significant opportunity for all farms and estates, no matter the size or type of enterprise. Even smaller farms can participate by joining forces together and trading in clusters. Our mission is to create a fair, efficient, and virtuous marketplace. There are already farmers on this environmental journey on their way to selling their carbon credits with Trinity NCM. We farm with integrated farm management principles at the core of what we do. We also farm regeneratively, so we are increasing the value of the natural capital in our soil, in our wildlife and in our environment on the farm. What these tools give us the opportunity to do is to add value to those products that we are actually creating by the way we're farming. We're reducing our environmental footprint. We're reducing our carbon footprint. And actually this needs to be rewarded in the marketplace. Trinity NCM, the UK's first independent, credible end-to-end -end natural capital trading platform. Well, thank you, Hussein, for that introduction. And I hope that you feel inspired by what you've seen and heard uh, so far and uh, wondering what the opportunities may lie on your farm uh, or with your clients, uh, as, as the case may be. Um, and now, we already have some questions and views. Thank you very much uh, for sending those through and keep them coming uh, in, the, in the chat room, please. Um, uh, we'll come to those in a minute. Um, uh, 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 and um, so we're going to look at three key areas uh, where we know that there's been much discussion. Um, and we're going to start with a poll question. So if I could ask for the first poll question to come up, uh, please. Uh, so um, should you be at net zero before you can trade carbon? Um, uh, should you be at net zero before you can trade carbon? And we've got four choices here, um, uh, either uh, yes or no, but there are two sort of qualifying bits of that. So yes, um, <clears throat> you feel that you should be at net zero before you can trade carbon, but you feel that trading carbon is a flawed concept anyway. Uh, yes, uh, carbon that you capture on farm uh, should be used, um, uh, sorry, carbon that you capture on farm uh, should be used 
to offset your emissions uh, with only any surplus available to trade, if that's how you feel, vote there. Uh, or no, uh, as long as you're on the path to net zero, um, you should be at, at net, uh, as long as you're on path to net zero, it's up to you how you use your carbon credits. Uh, or no, you should be able to trade credits both for progress towards net zero and for the carbon you sequester. So if you'd like to put in your votes there, it looks as though the second option uh, is, um, is, is leading the, the field on this one. So, um, so yes, you feel that uh, uh, you should be at net zero before you trade carbon, um, uh, and that carbon you capture on farms should be used to offset your emissions with only any surplus available to trade. Uh, well, that's, uh, I'm going to uh, invite my colleagues to join us now. So if, if you can turn your, your cameras on, please. Um, uh, so we've got, we have Richard Williamson, our Senior Managing Director. We have Dr. Alistair Sykes, uh, Managing Director for Sustainability. Juan Palomares, who's Managing Director for, for Europe, for the European Union. Uh, and Louisa Nocker, who's Senior Manager with Trinity NCM. So Louisa, I'm going to start with you. Uh, and I'd just like you to, I know that you've done an awful lot of work in this area. Um, uh, Louisa, so um, uh, what are your views here on this, uh, this idea of net zero? Thank you, Tom. So the question, should you be at net zero, is a matter of choice and it's a business decision depending on your individual farm business circumstances. Um, but the question, do you have to be at net zero? The answer is no, you do not have to be at net zero before trading carbon. And we can get into why that is if the discussion takes us there. But ultimately, to generate and sell carbon credits, you have to improve your carbon footprint um, on your farm or enterprise. And you would do that um, by reducing emissions or, uh, and or increasing sequestration. However, it's important to note, if you start uh, trading carbon before you reach net zero, it might um, make it difficult for you to reach net zero yourself. And that is because when you sell carbon credits you are selling the right to claim your emissions improvements on your farm um, so you cannot claim yourself the emissions reduction or the increased sequestration if you have sold them in the form of carbon credits so as i said before it comes down to a business decision on where you want to get value from your farm management practices great no thank you very much for that louisa now we've got quite a lot of um uh, talk coming through on the uh, on the chat. Um, uh, there's quite a lot of people who are concerned about the greenwashing uh, aspect of this. Aren't you facilitating greenwashing by corporations seeking license to continue emitting greenhouse gases? Uh, says Tom Clark. Thank you for that, Tom. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, Juan, uh, I know that you've done quite a bit of work um, uh, in in this area. Uh, could I ask you to, to, uh, to give your views here, please? Yes. Um, I mean, the, the, the answer is very simple. Um, and this is what basically the tax force on scaling voluntary carbon markets is saying and other similar organizations, which is if you are a corporation and you are buying offsets, this has to be because you have done first a lot of work on your end to reduce your emissions to reach a point where you have only what is called residual emissions, which you cannot reduce anymore. And then for those residual emissions is where, when you are allowed to buy carbon offset, offsets. And those are the type of companies that we are working with. Yeah, um, the, the, I, there is this sort of difference between removal credits and reduction credits. Um, uh, and and I, I, I just wonder whether, um, you know, perhaps we need to clarify uh, just what the difference is. Uh, Louisa, can I ask you to, uh, to come back again on that and just sort of clarify what, what's meant by reduction credits and what's meant by removal credits and um, uh, what, are the, what, are the, what are the sort of differences, what, what are the options here for them? Yeah, of course. So reduction credits refer to a reduction in emissions. So one carbon credit is a ton of CO2, carbon dioxide, but a reduction credit is one ton of carbon dioxide that is no longer being emitted. And then a removal credit is one ton of carbon dioxide that is sequestered from the atmosphere. And what is um, so interesting and important from the agricultural sector is that um, it's one of very few sectors that can achieve both reduction credits and removal credits. And that is why 
businesses in other sectors voluntarily want to purchase credits from the agricultural sector because they are not able to achieve both types of um, reduction and removal. Great. Um, now, this issue of um, greenwashing, uh, and I can see from the chat, thank you very much for your contributions, by the way, um, that this is a topic of huge concern. Um, uh, Richard, uh, I'd like to bring you in, uh, if, if that's OK, um, and just address this, uh, this, this issue. I mean, so what, what, are we, what are we talking about here? I mean, um, why? Um, uh, when is it greenwashing? Um, when is it doing good? Um, I, I don't know, you know, what your views are on this on this issue of greenwashing, Richard. Well, thanks, Tom. I, I think essentially it's been answered by by Juan, and, and that is that you know certainly for large corporations, that you know the idea that they can abdicate responsibility for uh, their own actions is is simply not not the case, and simply not allowable. So, I mean. But the reality is, of course, there will be some enterprises, uh, certainly within farming, for instance, that will struggle to get to any kind of net zero position because simplistically any kind of um, intensive livestock will, will find it really very, very difficult. And I think what, what they should do, um, like the corporations, is to look at pretty well mitigating whatever emissions they can, but there will be some residual emissions that cannot be. And I think then it's, it's legitimate for people to trade that. Yeah, thank you very much, Richard. Now, there has been uh, quite a lot of concern in the chat uh, area about this issue of sort of long-term uh, sort of locking up the carbon, if you like, and locking up your, your options. Um, uh, Louisa, could I ask you just to sort of explain, you know, some of the contractual arrangements uh, perhaps around this and, and, and what it means to farmers? Yeah, sure. So this goes back to reduction and removal credits, actually. With reduction credits, you cannot um, reverse that. So when you reduce your emissions, say you reduce by one ton of carbon dioxide, you sell one cre carbon credit, um, you have reduced your emissions by one ton and um, the purchaser of that credit can then claim that reduction in their carbon footprint accounting. Um, you can do that in just a one year contract. So it can be a spot trade. Uh, when it comes to removal credits, you are sequestering carbon from the atmosphere and we that can be reversed. So we have a retention period of on the practice. Um, so for instance, if you um, go from full tillage to re reduced tillage or zero tillage, you will sequester carbon in your soil. And we have a retention period on that practice so that the soil is not only sequestered, but also locked up in the soil. So it doesn't get reversed. Great. There's also been quite a lot of talk uh, in there about some of the uh, the verification um, uh, procedures uh, in, involved. Um, Juan, uh, I, I wonder whether you'd like to just um, uh, give a few views on the on the verification within the within uh, NCM. Yes, definitely. So the, the first thing to say is that there is a difference between validation and verification, and we do both. So validation is uh, when you when you go on Trinity and you come up with a plan, uh, an external third party auditor will look at that plan and the feasibility of that plan. And that, that's what validation is about. Then as time goes by, uh, when you implement those practices, those mitigation practices, then you have to prove and you have to give evidence, which can be in the shape of receipts, pictures, videos, uh, interviews, about what you actually did. And then the third party auditor will do the verification. Now we work with third party auditors that are accredited by the International Accreditation Forum. They do this uh, according to ISO 14065 and ISO 14064 standards. And what this means effectively is that our carbon credits are aligned with 14064 uh, 2 ISO standard. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I'm actually, move... Sorry, could I add to that? Just I'm just looking through the, the chat as well. Just on top of what Juan said, um, because of the verification process, you only can sell the credits. Um, you know, well, you sell them once they have been, um, once the emissions have been reduced or have, the carbon has been sequestered. So it's ex post, which literally means after the fact. And, the, the, you know, the practice has been verified. So that's another step in the verification process. We make sure it actually has occurred before 
um, the credits can um, be transferred to a buyer. Yeah, and I get uh, what's the um, uh, I, I suppose the the um, uh, the concept here, Louisa, is that um, Sandy provides the, the measuring and the monitoring uh, behind it. Uh, is, is is that correct? <laughs> Yes, oh, exactly. Great. Thanks, <laughs> Wait. No, you all set. I think someone's forgotten to mute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, exactly, Tom. Um, uh, Sandy measures the um, the emissions and sequestration occurring on the enterprise or farm annually. So we have a, a holistic view of what's going on um, every year um, to verify what's happened, what emissions have occurred, what sequestration has occurred. And then um, once we've done that, we can verify what credits have been generated. And just to add to, to that, Luisa, um, the difference between us and a lot of uh, project developers that are using other registries and they are doing work manually is that because uh, Trinity NCM standards has been coded, have been coded in Sandy, in Trinity Actec, we are bringing down, bringing down costs significantly for farmers. Uh, we are also ensuring compliance with the standards. We are allowing for tier two and tier three calculations uh, in terms of carbon footprint. And this is something that cannot be done in an Excel spreadsheet. We are saving, saving time because we have integrations with farm management systems. We are mitigating operational errors. And we're also setting controls like time stamping or geolocation of evidence. Yeah, um, we've got one or two comments coming in in the chat about the actual uh, the sort of standards that are being used. For example, John Harrison, thank you for your comment. Um, have we got have we actually got verified figures for soil sequestration or has the figure just been plucked from the air? Uh, no, <laughs> John, it hasn't been plucked from the air. Alistair, I'm going to ask you to uh, address that one uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, how the how the figures, how Sandy actually comes up with the uh, with the figures. Yeah, absolutely. Um... No, that's no problem. The so very briefly, the soil carbon model that we use in Sandy um, is IPCC uh, 2019 tier two. Um, what that means in practice um, is that it's a highly detailed process-based model um, that can make predictions about soil carbon um, depending on different climates, different soil types, um, and a wide range of practices. That's ex ante um, in the context of carbon credits. So what we're doing there is looking at practices that are proposed and verifying that the that the plan um, is going to uh, is going to produce sequestration and, and that, that that is going to work on a biophysical level and as louisa said then the credits themselves are actually sold after the fact um, once that once that carbon has been sequestered um, and that can be done uh, via via a number of uh, or that can be uh, validated i should say by a number of, um, of methods Great, thank you very much, Phyllis. I'm going to move things on to the next question. Um, uh, so, uh, if we could get the next question up, uh, please. Um, uh, and, um, and so, this looks at the ownership of natural capital, um, uh, and there are three options here. I, I hope you can actually see all of the options, but I'll read them out just in case you can't see them. Um, so, uh, do you feel that it's owned by landowners and the agri-food industry who should reward farmers uh, with lower rents and uh, produce premiums? Uh, uh, or do you feel that it's owned by the farmers um, who can use it to, to trade credits and tokens? Uh, or do you feel that it's up to individuals uh, to make their own contractual arrangements? Um, so if you'd like to vote on there, um, and oh, it looks as though uh, uh, the it's the third option, the uh, it's up to you to make your own contractual arrangements um, seems to be uh, the most um, uh, the most popular one here. So, uh, Richard, I'll, I'll ask you, to, can I ask you for your thoughts here? Sure. Uh, first of all, I'm delighted the third option is the one that uh, seems popular. Um, I think from my perspective, what I'd like to just mention is that you know, farmers need, need to be certainly more proactive than they have been hitherto. We know that the basic payment over time has um, essentially meant a, 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 a slightly passive um, primary production sector. And I think farms will need to be more, more proactive. And in that sense, I would hope that they would want to measure their own carbon, uh, their own, have their own data on farms. And, and, and the key thing for that is whatever value that might be attached to that. If you own the data that supports that, there's a realistic chance you'll be able to capture that value. So I would absolutely implore 
farmers not to give away that data and absolutely not to see it consolidated up into premiums on prices for produce. For certain farmers will need to make investment and make commitment to improve their net carbon balance and that will need to be recognized to a degree. I guess the question for me is will net zero produce, so will, if people have a journey towards net zero and achieve net zero, will, will that have a value in the marketplace? So will net zero wheat, barley, wheat, peas, whatever it happens to be, have a value that is likely to be sustained in the market? We know that premiums on prices over time tend to get eroded. Or will farmers more likely uh, possibly trade that carbon independently to secure an income stream. And I think this, the nature of this is, this recognises the dynamic nature of both the, the farm market, the fertiliser market, the diesel market, the carbon market. This, this will be a much more dynamic exercise than it has been previously. Yeah, no, um, thank you very much for that, Richard. I, I wonder whether you could just um, also address the, the issues of, of data ownership um, and, um, you know, how, sh how, is, uh, how should data be treated? Um, uh, you know, who, um, who owns it? Who, who should have control over it? How should data, how should one's data uh, be used? I think, first of all, farmers need to recognize, farmers need to recognize hopefully, that there, there needs to be a commitment made to secure this data. You know, farmers like things for free. All, all I would say here is that, that there may be a cost of securing data on your own farm, but that data will have a real value. Uh, and, you know, that, that's a, a step change and a change in mindset for me from the farming. So, you know, make an investment in the data, have it secured for yourself, not for anybody else. Great, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much to uh, Anita Simington, who put forward a comment in the chat here. Um, ownership of carbon sequestration is legally complex. Uh, what checks are made to ensure the trader is legally entitled, entitled to trade, uh, notably vis-a-vis -vis landlords, mortgages, farm partners' rights? Um, uh, Louisa, uh, oh, sorry, it's one. Would you like to uh, address that one? Yes. Definitely. So, and this is a very good question. So the, the first thing to say is that um, Trinity is very different from other platforms. And this is because we have been working with one of the leading uh, rural estate lawyers in the UK. And by doing that, we have ensured that our, our that we have basically harmonious legal and contractual underpinnings between landlords and tenants, as well as fair governance and delineation of different activities that may be undertaken. Okay, so that's the first thing to say. Now, the second thing is when farmers or land managers go through our onboarding process in Sandy, what they do is what they do first is they fill out a digital form. And this form basically focuses on two things. One is the ownership of the potential for carbon reduction or removal. And the second one is the commitment to the delivery of that reduction or removal. And this form is different, it's like two different customer journeys, depend, depending on whether we are dealing with freehold or leasehold land. And it also deals with other nuances, such as contract farming agreements, partnerships, trusts, land charge as a security for a mortgage or a loan, you name it. And then the final step, if you will, is that once they go through that form, um, the farmer or the land manager will sign a list of general warranties and warranties specific to their situation. And this legal document will basically offer protection for both buyers and sellers in the platform. And then there, there may be an optional step to get the landlord's consent to unlock the full value of the natural capital. Great. No, thank you very much for that then, Juan. Um, uh, just uh, looking at the uh, some of the comments coming through in the in the chat here. Um, uh, thank you to Sarah Hughes. Is it a farmer's responsibility to worry about greenwashing? If farmers have a new income stream opportunity with carbon trading by their management practice, isn't this the point? Uh, should they uh, uh, have to worry about the companies who are purchasing their carbon? Farmers don't currently have responsibility for the consumer ethics who buy their produce. Um, Louisa, I wonder whether you could just um, explain, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, this this idea of of you know being able to to choose who you sell your carbon credits to. Is is, is that the case? Absolutely, yes. Um, so. The sellers of carbon credits, so the farmers and land managers, um, can choose who they sell to, um, and therefore they can filter out, um, you know, buyers just to select buyers who have certain 
um, ESG criteria or have a net zero target um, and that sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, the, the sellers have choice um, and flexibility with what they do. Brilliant, thank you very much for that. Now I'm going to move things on uh, and thank you very much to Peter Meadows uh, for your comment here. Uh, interested to hear about the wider natural capital options. Are there opportunities currently available for improving air, water quality or public access to natural spaces? Well, uh, Peter, I'm glad you asked that because that brings me to our next question um, and our final question here. Um, if we could bring that up. Yes. So should biodiversity have a value? Should biodiversity have a value? And again, we've got four possible answers here. Uh, and so if you feel no, that shy biodiversity shouldn't have a value, um, do you think it's wrong to put a monetary value on nature? Uh, or do you think uh, no biodiversity shouldn't have a value, but we should have accurate ways to measure it? Um, or do you think that biodiversity should have a value and that farmers should be rewarded through public funded schemes such as ELMS? Uh, or do you feel that farmers should benefit through both public funded schemes and the private markets? Uh, so if you'd all like to vote, oh, it looks here as though most people believe that, um, that farmers should benefit and they should benefit through public funded schemes and private markets. Uh, so now, Alistair, our, um, you're our Managing Director of Sustainability. I know that you've done an awful lot of work uh, in this area. Uh, so could I just ask you to address this one? I'm, I'm glad that that came through as the, the popular answer, because I, um, I would tend to agree. I think sort of starting from the beginning, um, if we talk about valuing biodiversity, um, we can use various frameworks for that. We can talk about the intrinsic value of biodiversity. We can talk about um, the utilitarian value. Um, it, I think whatever framework you use, the answer tends to come back that as an ecosystem service, higher biodiversity is, is, is a valuable thing. So the question then becomes, how do we actually quantify that value and how do we put that value not just on biodiversity as a concept, um, but on a particular farm and the practices that are being um, undertaken on that farming system. Um, and so I think this is where it becomes really interesting because biodiversity is, um, I would say it, it has an intrinsic value. Uh, it's something that we perceive. Um, and so it, it's something that has been valued historically, um, just in a very informal sense. What that does though, is that it limits the extent to which that farmers can benefit. Um, it is a public good, it's doing, um, it's doing good outside of that, that specific farm business. Um, but the fact that it is um, difficult to quantify has limited the extent to which that, that we can start to think about things like public funded schemes, although obviously that has, that's become more of a, a feature over the last couple of decades. And it's certainly limited the extent to which biodiversity can play a role in private markets. Um, so I think that then leads us on to talking about how we quantify biodiversity, and I, I'll, I'll keep this answer short on that, but, but it, uh, I think basically the, the key thing to, um, to think about in this space is how we quantify biodiversity and how we make sure that that system is standardised and can be applied fairly equally across different types of farming systems. And as you know, that's obviously something that we've been focusing on uh, very closely with Infinity and Trinity Ag Tech. Yes, and it's not just biodiversity, um, as far as I gather, um, uh, Alistair, there's also water quality as well. Um, uh, I, I don't know whether you would like to, uh, but that's a, an, another aspect that we can, uh, we can monitor and measure, I believe. Absolutely, yeah. And um, so I think this is really where um, a system like Sandy um, comes into its own. We've been focusing very heavily on uh, talking about carbon um, for the first couple of questions, and I think that's absolutely right, given you know, given the, the nature of the discussion, given where we are as, a, as an industry. Um, but in a general sense, um, and when we're talking about adding value on the farm and bringing that value back to the farmer, being able to capture the farm's data um, as a sort of single source of truth, and then use that to, to inform um, standardized, validated metrics for things like water protection and biodiversity, and to make sure that those are represented alongside um, the assessment of carbon, when we're selling carbon credits, or even as their own um, uh, their own benefits, their own their own uh, possible sort of um, uh, markets in and of themselves, um, is hugely important. So yeah, water protection and essentially um, looking at quantifying nitrate leaching and biodiversity, building up a holistic model of the the biodiversity um, net gain on that on that farming system, the practices that are being observed, and obviously modeling the carbon alongside and bringing all of that together um, really sort of supercharges the possibility um, for bringing that value back to the farm. 
Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that, Alistair. Now, there's a um, there's a sort of distinction, if you like, between um, uh, 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 you know the, the carbon um, sorry uh, biodiversity tokens and and, and co benefits. Um, uh, I wonder whether um, uh, Louisa, if you could just sort of um, uh, sort of put some flesh on on the bones there. You know, what what do we mean by co benefits? Absolutely. So, um, with co benefits, we refer to carbon credits so as i said that's a ton of um carbon dioxide equivalent um but with the co-benefit of biodiversity or water protection um other like na nature-based solutions that are um attached to the carbon credit because of the practice that has been used to generate that credit um so for example um i don't know if you uh Okay, a simple example, if you grow hedgerows or trees, um, that might uh, generate, well, it will generate carbon credits, but there will be um, biodiversity um, advantages there, especially if the trees are native, um, and um, also potential water protection uh, benefits there uh, through um, less uh, leaching um, into water systems. Um, but I hasten to add, uh, using trees as an example is tricky. It's a simple example, but um, at Trinity we uh, um, we do not believe in um, changing agricultural land to just um, hectares of trees. We have um, a yield threshold. So if a farm um, is generating a lot of carbon credits but has reduced their yield because they've just turned a field into uh, you know a hectare of woodland or whatever. Um, they will not generate credits. That's part of our standards and uh, our methodology there um, because they, we don't believe in that. It would cause carbon leakage. Um, if you're reducing yield on one person's farm, then you are likely increasing emissions um, somewhere else on another farm to replace the lost yield. Now, that's a really uh, important point, uh, I, I think, um, uh, Louisa. And, um, and, and that does sort of underline the um, the sort of need, if you like, for farmers to take control of their own natural assets and their own um, uh, uh, data, if, if, uh, if you like. Um, uh, and this this element of, um, you know, replacing trees with, uh, sorry, replacing farming with trees. Um, uh, I mean, and, and as far as I gather, you know, this is not the idea, this is not the idea of what of what's happening here, um, uh, of using, you know, uh, of, um, uh, you know, sort of realizing the value from your natural capital. It's not about planting trees everywhere. Um, uh, Alistair, uh, I wonder if I can bring you in here. We had a discussion the other day about, um, uh, you know, less favored areas, for example, and the opportunities there. Um, uh, would you like to just sort of, um, uh, in, 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 a, in a minute or two, just, uh, you know, outline some of the issues, especially for less favored areas? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think the, so the key thing, um, that is in my mind when we're talking about trading natural capital um, on farms is really maintaining the nature of that farming system and also giving the land manager choice over the, um, the measures, the, the management practices um, that they choose to implement. So it's not a prescriptive system. It's not about saying, if you have this land, then you need to do this with it in order to generate carbon credits. It's rather about saying, this is, this is your baseline. Um, these are the management practices that you can consider. And as an expert, essentially on your own farming system, you will be able to make the best possible choice um, with all of the different elements of your system, biophysical, financial, practical, you know, aligned in your own mind. Um, and so that, that's the nature of the system that we're putting together. So the idea that in order to trade carbon, you need to convert land wholesale from, you know, extensive grazing to, um, you know, to woodland really doesn't 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 wash as far as i'm concerned um, and louisa did a fantastic job of um, describing exactly how uh, the the leakage the the sort of the, the fallacy essentially of, of, of um, net sequestration would uh, would play out in that circumstance um, so I hope, I hope that um, gives some food for thought no absolutely thank you very much for that uh, alistair well look with that's nearly all we've got time for and I, I i must say that the chat 
has been fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for all of your contributions. Uh, I'm going to draw this session to a to a close shortly, um, and I'd like to thank Richard, Alistair, Louisa, and Juan for all of your input, uh, and, and thank you also for joining us um, and for your questions and comments. Uh, and if you can bring up the slide, uh, please, Kevin. Um, so uh, listen, grab your smartphone and take a picture or zap the QR code uh, on here, uh, and then please get in touch uh, because we'd like to hear from you. Um, uh, and and um, uh, and we've got a very busy week coming up next week. Uh, Trinity NCM opens for commercial trading uh, on Tuesday, the 11th of January. And, and I hope that you'll take a look uh, at what's on offer. And then on Thursday, we're very excited about the release of Sandy version two. Uh, so our digital assistant, already the best software for managing all your natural capital, just got better. Um, and on the same day at 8.30, we're holding a webinar where we'll be looking in more detail uh, at how Sandy measures and manages your natural capital and particularly its new features. Um, and then how Trinity NCM can now monetize it. Um, so please, we'd very, very much like you to join us there. Um, now, I know that I, and I can see in the in the chat, we've had some really, really interesting conversations there. Um, uh, and, um, what I'd like you to do is bring that to the webinar next uh, uh, next week, and we'll explore some of those issues in more detail. I hope we'll be able to capture some of those views um, uh, and, and, and bring them bring them forward, uh, because this is such an interesting area and it's such an important area uh, for farmers. So, um, but look, that's all we've got time for. Thank you again for joining us. Do get in touch or come to our website, bring us your views, and we all look forward very much to seeing you all again. Uh, so look, enjoy the rest of your conference and goodbye. Thank you.